Welcome to the Ancestral Health Symposium. So make sure to use hashtag AHS14 and all your <laughs> Twittering and Facebooking. Um, thank you for being here. Everyone who comes to this event, whether you're helping put it on, if you're attending, it's really a volunteer effort and you just believe in kind of the same purpose that we're trying to accomplish here. Um, I want to make sure that all our volunteers are recognized. We don't need to name names because there's so many of them. Um, but if you could just give a round of applause for all the volunteers. So since the beginning, this event has really been volunteer driven and um, we're so blessed to have so many people from all over the world who just believe in what we're doing and are willing to go out of their way um, to make it happen. So the Ancestral Health Symposium is organized by the Ancestral Health Society, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Um, and we're tasked with the mission about to educate the public about ancestral lifestyle dynamics. So we're here to learn, but we're also here to enjoy community, enjoy friendship. Um, the University of California has deep roots with the Ancestral Health Symposium. The first event back in 2011 was at UCLA. And uh, Aaron's a professor at UCLA. And Tess, our uh, program chair, did her PhD here at UC Berkeley. I went to UC Davis for undergrad. And Seth Roberts, um, our late friend and colleague, was a professor here at UC Berkeley. So Seth really has a lot to do with why we're all here today. Thanks, Brent. Uh, and I wanted to take a couple of minutes to talk about Seth. Um, so who here has been impacted in some way by the Ancestral Health Symposium? Raise your hand. Made an impact on your life in some especially positive way. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> I didn't put that in the initial question. Well, you can thank Seth for that, because it was through my friendship with Seth and doing research with him as a, you know, a fellow learning theorist, uh, pigeon research, that I discovered the other sides, the other facets to Seth, which included his interest in self-experimentation uh, and his interest in health and his interest in just life as a scientist, a true scientist at heart views it. And it was through his, um, my friendship with him that I came across his blog as well, that he told me he puts a lot of his uh, self-experimentation writings there. So I started reading his blog, and that's how I discovered people like Mark Sisson, and Rob Wolf, and Weston A. Price, and the kind of people, they're the, some of the leaders in, the, both the academic and non-academic senses of the evolutionary medicine movement. Uh, and it was also through Seth that I discovered the epistemocrat. Um, and Brent Pottinger had his own blog as well. And I started reading that and we became fast friends. And it was because we were, whenever um, Brent would come down to LA um, and from San, uh, Sacramento, come down to LA to visit and we'd get together. And we went to a um, a symposium being held at UCLA called New Directions in Physiology. And it was a very interesting symposium, lots of neat stuff going on there. But of course, all the talks ended with something like, and so now we have new kind of pharmaceutical um, um, targets to look for, right? And we're like getting so frustrated because they, they would talk about the science of physiology and human health and using animal models, human models, and then at the last minute, rather than thinking about, well, what's causing these? What modern mismatches and evolutionary discordances in, between our modern lifestyles and that to which we're, our physiologists have been adapted, what mismatch there is, is causing these problems in the first place? Rather than trying to do that, they were saying, well, let's think, think about how we can now fix these problems pharmaceutically. And so we got a little frustrated with that. And Seth was a sounding board uh, along the whole process of setting up the first Ancestral Health Symposium, was an attendee, a speaker. He was on the Ancestry board helping us out. And so he was here in spirit the whole way through. And so it was very discouraging and sad when, when we learned a few months ago about his untimely passing um, here in the hills of Berkeley, actually. And so we are dedicating um, this symposium this year 
to the memory of Seth Roberts. And in fact, there will be a special symposium um, at the conclusion of AHS after it's over on Sunday, um, in which we will be, some of his friends will get together to honor him in some talks. And so we hope that uh, some of you can stay through to that as well. Thanks, Aaron. So one of my uh, most prominent um, memories of Seth is that he cared about ideas um, really deeply. He thought ideas mattered. And he didn't really care about traditional social hierarchies. And from the beginning, he really liked AHS because this was an event where people from all walks of life could come together on an equal playing field and just discuss ideas. And so this event's about big ideas, small ideas, fringe ideas, new ideas. Um, but Seth was also practical. He wanted ideas to matter. He wanted them to make a difference in people's lives, to enhance their quality of life. So he's big on self-experimentation. It's a process that empowers people to take ideas and make them real, concrete realities in their own life. So we're also here to share our own self-experiments, to share ourself, to share our lessons learned from experience, and to enjoy community. Um, so with that, I just want to say that Seth definitely planted many seeds in the quantified self and the ancestral health uh, garden. And it's up to us to water them, make sure they get enough sunlight, and uh, ensure that they blossom for years to come. So thank you for being here. And now Tess is going to tell you a few more details about the following um, few days. All right, I'll make this super quick. So the online schedule, you can go to hs14.shdlr.com, and we will keep that updated if we have any changes in the schedule. But there's also a PDF version that has more detailed abstracts and bios on the website. So if you go to the website, and then you can find the, the PDF there. Uh, we're going to have two sessions going at the same time. So for Thursday and Friday, the second room will be in the, bank, uh, the Bancroft Hotel in the Great Hall. So to get there, you just go outside and walk down Sproul Plaza to Bancroft Avenue and turn left, walk down that about two blocks, and then, or three blocks, and then the hotel will be on the right side. And it's easy to find the Great Hall when you get there. And then on Saturday, we'll have the second talks in the Valley Life Sciences Building, and that's right here on campus. It's a little bit closer, and you just go outside and turn to the right, and it's just, it's kind of in that direction from, from here. We'll have volunteers out telling people where to go and pointing along the way, too. So. And if you have any questions, you can ask, find the volunteers in the blue shirts. Lunch, we have set up in Crossroads Dining Hall, which will be a few blocks away. And once again, we'll have people leading the way over there around lunch. And it's included with the dorms, but people who are not staying in the dorms can go there and buy uh, lunch on site. And it's going to be $12.50 per person. We have some special meals set up that are gluten-free and they have taken a lot of allergens into account, and they also have allergen information on their website. So if you go to caldining.berkeley.edu, you can click on menus, which is on the top menu there, and it'll bring up the list you can see a week in advance. Click on the day, and then if you click on each food, it'll tell you exactly what's in it. Um, there's also breakfast happening, similar, but this one is at the Foothill dorm and it's 10.50 per person. For the bathrooms, you go outside, the door is here, turn right, and go up the stairs, and they're, they're right over there in the hallway, and there's also a drinking fountain there. And movement sessions will meet right outside in front of this building. Um, we're gonna have exhibitors set out outside on the plaza, so go and check them out. We have a bunch of awesome stuff here this year. And that is all I have. Okay, so the next thing is going to be the poster preview. So that is starting right now. Okay, so you can bring up the poster previews. Can I get the poster presenters to all come up here? Yeah, you just, just make sure that you're in this area because we're going to go through them really quickly. And what we have going on here is this mic 
is sounds good in this room, and this one is for the recording, so you're gonna have to hold both of them. Sorry about that. We got the poster preview slide up? Yeah. Okay, we'll start with Nathan Brantman. Did I pronounce that correctly? You can, you can say your name. I'll say it, yeah. yeah. Good morning, everybody. Ooh, sorry. Good morning. Uh, my name is Nathan Brummeyer. I am co-owner of CrossFit Adventure and Rethink True Health. Uh, you can find my podcast on iTunes. And I know we're all here for an exciting, fun-filled weekend, so I hate to be a negative Nancy and start off everything. I can't believe I'm the one starting this with, there is no cure for cancer. What a terrible way to start this out. Sorry about that. Um, really, cancer is something that everybody gets. We all get cancer at least six times throughout our entire lifetime. There's not really a cure for something that we inherently get. Diabetes, heart disease, Alzheimer's, not everybody gets those. Yet here we are trying to allopathically treat cancer, something that everybody gets, the same way as all those other diseases that not everybody gets. So there's something just inherently wrong with that. Our bodies can deal with cancer. Our bodies know what to do. We have mechanisms designed to seek out and destroy cancer. So what we need to do is support those mechanisms. We need to give it the ancestral support that our bodies need. Thank you guys. Stop by my, my poster, I guess, tomorrow? Yeah. Tomorrow right. afternoon. Okay, next, it's Mark, right? Mark Brubbs. And if you want to stand at the podium too, you can also do that. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is uh, Dr. Mark Bubbs. I'm a naturopath from uh, Toronto, Canada. I also work as the sports nutrition lead with the Canadian men's basketball team. So tomorrow I'll be doing my poster presentation on the impacts of the paleo diet on the gut, and more specifically looking at some difficult clinical cases where the paleo diet or the implementation of the paleo diet was really the tipping point to see some real lasting change. And we're going through some of the lab markers, functional lab markers in terms of digestive health that reflect uh, the symptomatic changes that they, they experienced. Thanks a lot, hope to see you tomorrow. Up next, Jim Cross. Uh, thank you, my name's Jim Cross. I'm an acupuncturist and naturopath. And um, I just want to say real quick, uh, the author of Devil in the Milk, Keith Woodford, he, uh, this is where I got the idea for A1 and A2 milk. And who you were talking about earlier, the gentleman um, is, Keith is, is very similar. He's interested in the scientific attitude, which is um, pursuing the scientific method with you know, integrity and not uh, you know, just trying to get rich. And so I just want to acknowledge you know, him, and he got me started on this. So basically, um, there's two types of protein in milk. One is whey, the other is casein. There are three types of casein, alpha, beta, and kappa. And in terms of beta casein, there are eight <laughs> sub varieties. And one of them, the A, uh, is the one that is concerned here. And about five to 10,000 years ago, there was a mutation which changed which created, uh, which created a new uh, variant, the A1. And the A2 is very stable. The A1, unfortunately, in the gut breaks down and forms this molecule uh, BCM7, and that has been associated with heart disease and type 1 diabetes. And there's a couple good charts here, and come talk to me tomorrow, and we can talk about this, and also my, new, my newest favorite book, which is Foodopoly. Thanks. Up next, Andrea Culbertson. Is Andrea here? I think she was actually running late from the airport. So I'll just mention that she's gonna be uh, talking about the ancestral food wheel, and she'll actually have a physical food wheel there set up that, that she'll be showing. So you should go check out her poster. <laughs> go to the next one. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. 
Ben Greenfield. Which which one do I talk into? Is oh. Sweet. I, I didn't draw that picture, by the way. I found it. I'm, I'm an even crappier artist than that. Um, so that's actually how I made my, my first standing workstation. I literally took a chair and put it on top of a table and then put my computer on top of that. Uh, I work with a bunch of people who fancy themselves as being really active, and then when we go in and break down their lifestyle, they'll, they're spending like 20 hours a day sitting down. We're talking about like CrossFitters who are doing like killer workouts and triathletes, but they're still sitting most of the day once you break it down. So my poster teaches you all of the ways that you can stand more in your office, in your home, in your environment, and basically how to biohack the hazards of sitting and all of the research and data that's out there on what sitting and a sedentary lifestyle does to you. So you're gonna learn how to stop doing what you're ironically doing right now. Um, and, <laughs> and, uh, and learn how you're killing yourself right now. Um, so it uh, should be a fun poster and come say hi. Jamie Gwinnett. Jamie here. Okay, we'll go to the next one. Summer in and in. Hi, I'm Summer Innanen, and I'm a certified nutritional practitioner from Toronto as well. And my poster explores how we can make paleo more emotionally sustainable. So a lot of people adopt the paleo diet, and it's really easy for them. But a lot of people struggle. They struggle with overeating, they struggle with cravings, and they can't keep it sustainable. So they go through these ups and downs. And so my, we have to look beyond typical stressors. Uh, at what creates emotional discomfort for these people. And so my poster explores three main areas, uh, lack of self-esteem and compassion, limiting beliefs, and lack of intuitive eating. It looks at the cycle within each of these, how they interact with one another, and how that leads to increased stress, depleted willpower and self-control, and lack of psychological satisfaction from food. It also looks at some practical solutions to these issues. So I can't wait to talk to you more about it. Kendall. Hi, I'm Kendall Kendrick, and hi, I'm Kendall Kendrick. I should know how to talk into a microphone. Um, you can find me on the newly launched E Physiologics, where I co host with Dr. Dan a new podcast called Living the Optimized Life, as well as video series called Shifting Human Potential. My poster, entitled Beyond Food, is about incorporating a holistic approach to a healthier mind, body, and spirit through the paleo diet and lifestyle. We are inundated in our society with a get thin and feel better fast mentality. And ever since the paleo diet started gaining popularity, we've mostly been focusing on nutrition. But now there's a shift in that paradigm, and we're looking at other aspects like our uh, highly stressed out lives, our lack of sleep, our inactivity, and our overexercise. So I call uh, this primal balance, these tenets of living a holistic lifestyle, mindfulness, play and fitness, nutrition, digestion, sleep, stress management, and the poster gives food goals, teaches the importance of proper digestion, discusses how to manage stress in a healthier way, offers 10 tips for play from the fitness explorer, Daryl Edwards, um, also um, addresses sleep hygiene, exploring mindfulness, uh, also 20 scientific reasons to start meditating today, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. My name is Ryan Lazarus, and I am a certified functional medicine practitioner, chiropractor, and certified nutrition specialist, and I have a wellness practice up in Napa. And I specialize in the treatment of diabetes, and just completing my master's in human nutrition, my final project was a literature review, which is behind me, and it is the poster, and it's titled Lifestyle-Induced Metabolic Inflexibility, which is a mouthful but I will define what metabolic inflexibility means, which is essentially the modern nomenclature for insulin resistance that is prompting metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, and the host of conditions associated with that. 
So in my research, I will identify and I will talk to you tomorrow about five fundamental factors that create a metabolic inflexible phenotype and what we can do to correct these using a functional medicine operating system. Thank you. Elke Nelson. Make sure I don't trip here because that happens a lot. I'm Elke Nelson. Uh, I have a background in molecular and cell biology, but I think I spent most of my thesis actually reading paleo literature. <laughs> um, so after I got my PhD, I actually went into health technology assessment, and I was a CrossFit coach. And even with my full-time job, I decided I really wanted to get into paleo more and more. So what I'm going to tell you about tomorrow is my company, ESN Fit, and how I work with a range of clients, and I write meal plans and do nutrition consulting and give seminars uh, for whole nine. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how I use a paleo template or a paleo framework and kind of go from that starting point to work with all different clients. So come see my poster tomorrow. Thank you. Alyssa Roden. Hi, my name is Alyssa Roden, and I'm a food sustainability blogger. And ever since I came to my first ancestral health symposium, I've always heard uh, this, this supposed truth repeated that there's a conflict between a paleo diet and sustainability. So as a scientist, I decided that I was going to go get some data and try and put some numbers to this problem. And so you know, what we know is that conventional meat production is unsustainable, that paleo diets advocate meat consumption for optimal health, and we know that diversified pasture-based farms can produce meat without a lot of the, the same environmental impacts as conventional meat. But what we didn't know going into this was how much meat sustainable farms could actually produce. For example, how much land would it take to supply everyone in this room or everyone in the United States with 6 to 12 ounces of meat every day? And of course, this goes to the underpinning uh, issue here, which is can a diet that is paleo also be sustainable? So at my poster t tomorrow, I'm going to present uh, the first numbers that I've been able to put to toward answering this question. And in the meantime, I invite you all to tweet your guess of how much uh, land we would need to develop as sustainable farmland in order to produce enough meat for all of us in the US uh, to eat. Hashtag AHS14. And how much meat? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, hopefully I get this right. I'm Stephanie Welch. Um, uh, not too many people here know me yet, but I'm really excited because a lot of people have been big influences on me that are here. Um, so let's see. I have uh, I've been a barefooter for uh, about a year now, and so I go everywhere in Boston barefoot. And uh, it, believe me, this it wasn't actually my first choice, but it's part of my mission to use evolutionary biology to try and solve all the world's problems healthcare, climate change, world peace. But that's kind of a lot, so I'm starting with physical health. Uh, two weeks ago, I actually broke my toe uh, at home, where everybody breaks their toes on furniture. So, uh, <laughs> and, and I was bummed out at first, but what I realized is it actually turned out to be a really good thing because the negative feedback from whenever I would put too much weight and like toe off too much would tell me to stop doing that and move better. So uh, what I want to basically leave you guys with is, is um, uh, we, we have to change our relationships with our feet. Um, actually, so pain is a feature, not a flaw, and especially when it comes to our feet. And so the, the negative feedback is there for our benefit. So it's, feet are far more durable than we give them credit for and so much better at their jobs. And until we start relating to our feet the same way that we relate to our hands, physically, psychologically, and neurologically, we're doing human wrong. But the good news is if we're doing it wrong, we can fix it. And if we can fix it, we can get much better outcomes in the future. So I hope to see you all at the poster session. Thanks. That's it. All right, that's all for the, the poster session. So there's going to be a long break now, I believe. Yeah, so there's a, a long break so that people can get over to the second room, and there's going to be volunteers leading people over to the Bancroft Hotel outside. So please stretch your legs for a moment, get outside, get some fresh air, and then come 
make your decisions on which room you're going to be in and please be here on time. Thank you.